fascinating business. Fascinating to everyone. Small boys, idlers at a whistle stop, restless adolescents, the traveling public. Yes, and fascinating even to the railroad men themselves. Every year, the railroads carry millions of passengers and billions of dollars worth of goods. We all know the engineer, the fireman, the brakeman, the conductor, the postal clerk. But few of us know anything about the great body of trained men who guard those millions of lives and billions of dollars in property by day and by night. The railroad detectives. They were organized for the railroads long before the Secret Service or the FBI, the Burns operatives or the Pinkertons. For more than a hundred years, the special agents have tracked down train wreckers, hold up men, card sharpers, baggage thieves, and all the other criminally minded who prey on the railroads, their passengers, and their freight. In crowded cities, the job is usually exciting, for something is always doing. And in the freight yards, too, where thieving is a favorite pastime of the neighborhood hoodlums. But in the out-of-the-way places, the routine can be a boring grind. One, the old-timers are anxious to escape. And it is to these more or less quiet spots that the new recruit is sent. But they also serve who stand and wait. In the afternoon of May 9, 1940, in Santa Marta, a division headquarters in California, investigator Johnny Douglas was one such recruit who stood and waited, bored, wondering if anything would ever happen to relieve the monotony. Tired. Doing what? Nothing, that's why I'm tired. Well, if it isn't smiling Johnny Douglas, people's protector. Shh. Listen. What is it? Thought I heard something. You got that way after a while. I used to think I heard things too. I was positive I heard the violent thrashing of bees' wings, or maybe a wood tick ticking. <laughs> I'm bored. What did I get a report? What would I report? Nothing ever happens in Santa Marta. Except you. You know, you're the nicest thing that's happened to me since I was sentenced to this devil's island. You and Jake and Pop Peters and Mabel Rumper and her two kids. You know, come to think of it, quite a few nice things have happened to me since I've been here. Well, you could be in worse places. At least the scenery is wonderful. I love it. Want a cup of coffee? Again? Got to do something to stay awake. Oh, well, wait till I give this to my boyfriend. I got it on purpose, as usual. You're going to stop pampering that youngster and start spoiling me. I haven't been seeing him all since I was three. Yes, I, I should have been an engineer. <laughs> Hello, Lucy and John. Hello, Mr. John. Tell Mr. Jones I'll send that rug pattern back next week. No hurry. Well, Pop, see you in Eltonville. Yeah. Thought you were smart, didn't you? Now, you leave this on. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Lucy. See that he wears it, Jake, and don't let him stick his head out of the cab. Just leave him to me, Lucy. I'll see that he behaves. What am I going to do with her, Johnny? Don't look at me, Pop. I'm a very happy man. Why don't you trade her in? Uh, had her too long. No trade in value. Listen, you, you're crazy about me and you know it. <laughs> And I meant what I said about the scarf. I'd wear a rattlesnake around my neck if you told me to. Johnny, if anything ever happens to me, you look after her, will you? I've been trying to take her off your hands for six months. She's partial to engineers, though. Listen, one helpless male is about all I can manage at a time. Uh, uh, uh. Bye, Bob. So long, Bob. <laughs> Goodbye, honey. Bye, Bye, Johnny. Bye, kids. Bye. 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 Well, what's the matter, Mabel? He forget it again? He'd forget his head if it wasn't hooked on him. Uh, Jake, your lunch. Well, well, if it ain't that Rumper woman. How do you do, Mrs. Rumper? A couple of nice-looking kids you got there. Well, you get down here and kiss these nice-looking kids goodbye. All right. Oh. Oh. I'll claim that one all right. But you, why, you look like a ringer. You ain't no Rumper. With coal dust on his face, he couldn't be nothing else. Go on, kiss him. After all the years you ate coal dust, another mouthful won't hurt you any. Hard. Now, you stick to soft coal, son, and you can fire a boiler twice as fast. Goodbye, Pat. Bye. You be good boys. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye honey. 
I wonder if you'd have that look in your eye for me if I went away, huh? Try it and see. <laughs> On that morning in early May, old number six, a combination freight and local passenger, bought the Twin Peaks grade as she had been doing for years. There was no sense of danger, no premonition of disaster. To engineer Peters and fireman Rumpler, it was just another routine trip. As it was to mail clerk Simmons, who was calmly at work sorting the mail. The presence of two large registered mailbags, containing among other things a $100,000 payroll, didn't bother him in the least. In the day coach, the passengers idled the time away in reading or talking, or in the case of the young couple who looked like they were on their way to get married, folding hands. Magazines, oranges, nice fresh oranges, apples, we better get something to nod, folks. Yeah, we're coming to a tunnel. Mm -hmm. A few moments later, number six entered tunnel 13. She was moving slowly on account of the steep grade, and judging by the smoke that poured from the smokestack, fireman Jake Rumpler was giving her everything she had taken. The train came to a stop with the passenger coach still inside the tunnel. There were no flares on the track, no visible reason for stopping. So this is the first time we ever stopped in this tunnel. You must have a pull with the engineer. Uh -huh. What are we stopping here for? What's wrong, Joe? I don't know. I'm going back to the flare. Well, move it backwards. Set the emergency brakes. I'll go forward.
At 2.45 that afternoon, Bill Olmsted, division superintendent, received the breakage call in his office at Santa Marta. On the line. Miss Peters, we'll see you. Title 13. Where's Johnny Douglas? Yes, Send him in here right away. Johnny. The engine and the mail car. Here's Johnny Douglas now. It's been an accident to number six at Tunnel 13. Get the details. Douglas speaking. Yeah, go ahead, Lolo. Give it to me. Yeah. Simmons, the mail clerk. Yeah. Jones, too, huh? Yeah, we'll get there as soon as we can. Olmsted will order a wrecking crew down from Meltonville. Back number 18 up on a siding so we can get through. Yeah. Okay. Ludlow was reporting from the junction. Cars broke loose from number six. He went back to the tunnel where the explosion occurred and found the mail car blown open and robbed. Two mail sacks with $100,000 were missing. What is it, Johnny? It's your dad. He's dead. The in romper both, along with Simmons and Jones. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I'm all right, Johnny. Things do happen at Santa Marta, don't they? Well, somebody has to tell Mabel Romper. It's up to you now, Johnny. Yeah. Get me an engine as quickly as possible, all right? Get me Chief Special Agent Wilcox. Wilcox is ready for just such an emergency. While still listening to details of the robbery and killing, he starts alerting all agencies at his disposal. All special agents and investigators are notified within a radius of 100 miles of Santa Marta. The Post Office Department, the Railway Express Company are notified too, and the FBI. A special plane, meanwhile, makes ready to transport Wilcox, postal inspectors, and express company detectives to Santa Marta, where they will join Johnny Douglas in the greatest criminal manhunt in the history of California railroading. Okay. Train's all ready, Jack. We're not back by the time Wilcox and his men get here. Have them set up. Number six was held up. Your husband, Pop Peters, Simmons, and Jones were all killed. That's all we know right now, Miss Rumpert. I'm going out there. I'll talk to you when I get back. I'm going with you. You can't help Jake out there. I'm sorry, Mabel. I want to be with him. Johnny's right, Mabel. We'll get the children go to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff here. Here, Johnny. Only I can't swear for these hounds. They haven't been working lately, and the critters are plain lazy. What happened, Johnny? A wreck? Yeah, Jake. A wreck. Let us go with you, Johnny. No, not this time, Jake. I think you better run along. Go on, I think you more once. Okay, Jake. Make a noise like an engine. Stay over the car in the dock and look after the body. Come on, Sheriff. There's still some fingerprints on it. They must have known number six slows to a walk in the tunnel. 
Well, there are a lot of footprints around here, but only two sets leading up the hill. Yeah, well, it wouldn't have taken more than two to handle the job. Let me see, one of them could have stood here, the other could have hopped aboard in the middle of the tunnel, maybe dropped down in the engine cab in the top of the east entrance there. Yeah, that's a trail, all right. Well, you better put those dogs on it while it's still fresh. Right. Run him down to Santa Marta and wait for Wilcox and the gang. We'll see you back there later. Gotcha, Johnny. <laughs> on the hillside there, Rupert, and turn them loose. Those tracks are fresh. Right, Johnny. It's a logging camp around here once. Maybe that's all they know about the road. Well, those dogs won't do much good. You better put them on the leash. Right. Okay, Pete. You take the dogs and follow us. We may need them again later. Okay, be within two shakes. was something I hadn't counted on. Yeah, I bet somebody did some fancy cussing around here. Well, they took everything with them, so they must be pretty heavily loaded. No registration certificate. Probably a stolen car anyway. Better take the engine number, though. We'll wire it on to Sacramento. Sure. Write this down, Max. Eight, two, three, five, nine, seven. Find anything? War and peace, Tolstoy. Now, what do you make of that? What? Not exactly the kind of literature you'd expect ordinary train bandits to read, huh? Hardly. Well, obviously, we're not dealing with ordinary men. This is a very well thought out robbery. Lynn Haven Bookshop. Might prove interesting. We have a mighty fine fingerprint man down the county seat there. Well, bring him around in the morning. Better bring a photographer, too. I want this truck shot from every angle. Sure thing. Well, here are the dogs. Might as well see what they pick up. Okay, men. We'll take it on foot from here. Uh, you, you stay here and watch these horses, just in case those fellas decide to double back. We don't want to be caught on the wrong end of a trick or something. <laughs> Still looks 
like there were only two of them. They'll keep to the water one way or the other to lose their trail. Yeah, you're right. Well, it's getting late. I gotta get back to Santa Marta to meet Wilcox. Nothing turns up, we'll pick up the trail here in the morning. Just as you say, Johnny, this is your show. Better search the underbrush around here pretty carefully. It's just a chance they may have dropped their packs so they'll travel light and fast. We'll go over every inch of her until it gets dark anyway, which isn't going to be far off. You better get going. Max, you work upstream. Charlie, you work down. Okay, Pete, turn them loose. which I've had teletyped on to Sacramento. Sacramento won't be of much help. Experienced crooks can change engine numbers as easily as phone numbers these days. The tarp must have been used to keep the dynamite dry. Well, the whole setup was planned and executed carefully. They knew the country well. They also knew there'd be a $100,000 payroll in those registered sacks. How? It's the first time that payroll had ever gone as registered mail. This is how, Chief. Look. Glenn Bartlett. Custodian of the Astor Mining Company payroll for more than 20 years makes his last trip. Next month, the job will be taken over by Uncle Sam when the payroll goes by registered mail. All laid out like a blueprint, isn't it? Sure is. They knew that exactly one month from that date, April 9th, there'd be another payroll shipment. And as for which train it went on. I don't know whether you folks knew Dan Simmons, the mail clerk who was killed today, but I did. That's him standing on the door next to old man Bartlett. That made it a cinch to check the train. What paper was this? Ronson Herald. Library stamps on it. Well, that's a lead, Johnny. This is Sheriff Babcock, men. Sheriff, this is Chief Special Agent Wilcox. Hi, Sheriff. Yeah. Postal Inspector Slade, Railway Detective Benton. Right. Well, Sheriff? No luck, Johnny. We followed the stream both ways until it got so dark we couldn't go any further. They hadn't come out of the stream yet. Well, pick up where you left off tomorrow morning. Sure will. But I'm afraid the trail will be cold by then. I'm glad to meet you, men. So long, Sherry. Thus, the manhunt began. And while the men who were to do the hunting sat glumly staring at the meager evidence, the hunted sought refuge in a deserted mine shaft some 12 miles distant. Johnny Douglas was right. The men who committed the crime had planned carefully, and the hideout in the mine shaft had been prepared especially for just such an emergency. These were the Devereaux brothers, Edmund and Paul. Another step, and I don't think I could have made it in. I'll give you a drink as soon as I light the lamp. Now lie still, and I'll bind your ankle. Tell you when. Ready? Pull! Badly swollen, but. I don't think it's broken. Just a bad sprain. I'll take it off. This is what I meant when I said, 
We might need this place in case anything went wrong. We could hide out here for a month if we had to. Yeah. If it hadn't been for this anchor, we could have brought the other mail sack with us. Forget it, kid. It wasn't your fault. It was an accident. And maybe for the best. We lay low until the search dies down. Then we go back and pick up the mail sack. Better? Only I... I... Only what, Paul? Only I wish you hadn't killed those men. You said we weren't going to do any shooting. I told you we wouldn't do any shooting unless we had to. When you dropped your mask and they saw your face, there was nothing else I could do. Now forget it. I... I can't forget it. Killing those men, especially that old fellow. Why, he looked just like Grandfather Delano or that old priest at the mission. The face was so gentle and so kind. It was them or us, Paul. And we've gone too far to be squeamish. You heard Grandfather Devereaux. It was shooting and killing that took everything away from our family in the old days. You haven't forgotten, Paul. We swore we would make the name of Devereaux mean something again. And we will, too. Everything's going to turn out just as we planned. You take a smoke. While I fix this something to eat, then we'll open the mail sack. Okay, then. That's all. How much do we have there? Eleven hundred and twenty-six dollars. The payroll's in the other sack. That's all right. Maybe it isn't such a bad break after all. It's in a safe place. As soon as things cool off, we'll go back and pick it up. Meantime, we can get along on this. Uh-huh. How long do you think we'll be cooped up here? Who knows, maybe a week, two, three, until those railroad detectives go back to pushing hobos around. Anyway, it'll be that long before you can walk again. I wasn't thinking myself, Ed. I was worrying about Grandpa Devereaux and... And Rose McCreary? I told you to forget her. Are we risking our necks to make a Devereaux out of a barber's daughter? Are we? I don't know, Ed. I don't know what to think. But you can't make me believe that all this shooting and killing and stealing will ever get us anywhere. You're in for a lot of false leads, Johnny. You know the tricks people's imaginations play on them. The minute they read or hear of this crime, they'll remember a thousand suspicious actions by a thousand different people. You'll get an awful lot of tips. The worst of it is you'll have to run most of them down in the hopes that one of them will be worth something. You wanted a job, Johnny. Well, you've got it. Well, I don't mind. I've got four good reasons for wanting to capture these men. Lucy, of course. Yeah. Mabel Rumpler and her two kids. Yeah. I'll keep in touch, Bill. If anything happens, just pass it on to me. Okay, Johnny. Well, goodbye. So long, Johnny. Bye. Anything I can do before I go? No, all the arrangements have been made. Funeral services will be held for all four at noon. I'm sorry I can't do that, honey. You understand. Of course. It's going to be kind of lonesome, though, without you and Dad. Well, I'll be back as soon as I can. Why don't you ask Olmstead for a few days off? No, I'd rather work. I'll feel much better in thinking that I have a little part in running down those men. Maybe it's better that way. How's Mabel holding up? All right. Seems kind of strange, though, not to hear her laughing. And the boys? Oh, it was awful, Johnny. Hours later, Special Agent Douglas arrives on the campus of the University of California to enlist the aid of Dr. Jerome Bowen, Associate Professor of Legal Chemistry and one of the foremost criminologists in the country. Well, that's it, Dr. Bowen. The whole works. What do you think? War and peace. Hmm. Interesting sidelight on character analysis. 
Just remember that. However, you better run this down. And this. Mm, better take those along, too. The rest you can leave with me. How long do you think it'll take? How long do you think it'll take me to correlate all these scraps of evidence? Well, not during my lunch hour. Well, if you could only give us some idea, we're pretty well stymied until well, you dope this out. Two weeks, maybe three. But I'll get in touch with you the minute we're finished. No worries. We'll try to be patient. Thanks a lot. Wilcox proved that he knew what he was talking about. Superintendent Armstead received hundreds of calls from all parts of the state. He sifted the calls and relayed on to Johnny the ones which he thought were worth checking. A woman who ran a grocery store in Brookville recalled selling a slab of bacon to two men who were dressed like lumberjacks. A hardware store proprietor in Sunrock remembered selling two boxes of 30-30 rifle shells to two men dressed as lumberjacks, but his description didn't tally with the woman's. The first bit of tangible evidence came from the bookstore in Lindhaven, where the proprietor remembered selling the book some two months previous to one of two men who came into his store. I remember, because we rarely sell a book of this type. It isn't exactly what you call popular reading. Can you remember what they looked like? Yeah, they were dark featured. I remember wondering at the time if they were brothers. About their size. One was tall, well built, over six feet. The other was uh, slightly shorter. How are they dressed? In rough clothes, with uh, wool shirts, and the trousers tucked into high lace boots. Well, they had cleats on the boots, too, like the lumberjacks wear. Look what they did to my floor. Can you remember anything else about them? Any physical deformity or peculiarity that might make them noticeable? No, I'm afraid I can't. Did you see what kind of a car they were driving? I'm sorry I didn't. They went out, and I paid no more attention. You've given us the first bit of real evidence we've had so far. Not much, a little. Much obliged to you. Oh, don't mention it. Only too glad to help. Oh, I might add that the men who, uh, whom I sold the book to didn't strike me as the type who'd hold up trains or commit murders. There's no specific type of criminal. The one person in the world you'd least suspect could turn out to be a murderer. Well, thanks again. Like the bookstore proprietor in Lindhaven, she too remembered the two men because they had damaged the floor with the cleats of their heavy boots. Well, I'll tell you. It was hardly more than three weeks after it was laid. I was never so disgusted with anything or anybody in all my born days. There. Just look at that. Isn't that an outrage, Mr. Douglas? To think anyone would have so little consideration for public property. Tess, my assistant, saw them get up. There were two of them, you know. And she came to tell me. But by the time she found me, I was in sociology doing research for the Cullen twins, but naturally Tess had no way of knowing that. They were on their way out the door. Oh, if only I could have gotten my hands on them. Those two men were murderers, Miss Tannehill. Murderers? Yes, they tore that page from your files and used the knowledge they found in it to hold up a train. Oh, I think I came that near being murdered. what they look like? Well, they wore flannel shirts and jeans and denim jackets, too. They looked like loggers or cowhands. Loggers, most likely, on account of the cleats in their shoes. Still, on the other hand, they wore cowboy hats. Oh, my. To think I came that near death. Oh, my. My. Well, I have a notion to resign. If it wasn't for my sister and my invalid mother, I do declare I think oh, that I was... a lot. Yeah. Then that night, when Douglas contacted Santa Marta, he learned from Olmsted that a gas station attended in Los Portos remembered the car and the two men in it. Yes, sir. I put gas in that old jalopy. Let me see. Wednesday. No, Tuesday, a week ago. There were two men in that car. Looked enough alike to be brothers. Thanks a lot. After two weeks of exhaustive search, Johnny returned to compare notes with Dr. Bowen. From the overalls, I learned a good deal. For instance, uh, here. Look at that. Wood fibers. Both hardwood and bark. The owner of those overalls worked in the logging camp. Uh, here, another. Now, black hair. Now, uh, note the size of this garment. From this and other factors, I'd say your suspect is about six feet two, weighs around 195 pounds, deeply tanned, has black hair, and looks something like this. Now, uh, 
Suspect number two is slightly smaller. Weighs around uh, 180 pounds and is about six foot one in height. His uh, hair is a shade lighter than the other man's, but it's still dark. He's probably younger and looks something like this. Now, judging from the striking similarity between hair and uh, bits of epidermis found on the clothing and other factors I needn't go into, I'd say these two men are brothers. Well, I've come to the same conclusion, Doctor, from the descriptions given to me by various people I've interviewed. Oh. <laughs> I see you just wanted to see what I'd cook up, eh? That's right. <laughs> anyway, the descriptions jive pretty closely with yours, and that's the important thing. They were looking for two men who might possibly be brothers and who look alike. I've got something else here. Here, take a look at that. Hmm. Huh. Looks like grains of salt. It is salt, found in the pocket of the overalls. Salt? Sulfur salt, type used by ranchers uh, as salt licks for cattle. Then our suspects were not only employed as lumberjacks, but quite possibly at one time or another could have worked on a cattle ranch. I'm certain that inquiries at logging camps and cattle ranches will lead to the identification of these two men. Hmm. Still a big order. <laughs> Although Johnny Douglas didn't know it at the time, that was the turning point in the Devereaux case. Three grains of salt. All right. Well, come here, let's see. Yeah, I guess so. Why don't you leave that here, Ed? Why? I think it's been just about enough killing. Still worried about those train men, aren't you? Forget it. I wish I could, Ed. If we get separated, I'll meet you at the bus station in Los Portos. Come on, we'll pick up the mail sack and be out of the mountains by daybreak. Okay. And watch your foot. Yeah. This is about it. The tree must be over there. Let's go. No, don't. What'd you shooting for, Ed? I had to. He saw our faces. He wasn't after us. Just a trapper. How would you know? Listen, we've got to get out of here. These hills are still full of searchers. This guy was probably one of them. We haven't time for that now. It's safer where it is. Come on. Two tickets to Elvis Flat. Have a cup of coffee while we're waiting. Why not? The Devereaux brothers did not go through to Elks Flats. That night around 10 o'clock, they dropped off the bus at High Water, about 60 miles south of Santa Marta. There they left the highway and cut across open fields to the old Devereaux Ranch, a once proud domain in the heart of the cattle country. Hey, Ed. Look, someone's at the house. Let's go. In the bright moonlight, the old ranch house with its sagging fences and overrun yards looked like a once beautiful woman, grown old and slatternly. Looks like Frank Kensel the Roan Horse. You know him, Ed. He's the foreman of a Rancho Rosita. What do you suppose he's doing here? He'd better not be putting the pressure on Grandfather Devereaux again, or I'll... I'll take it easy. Good enough shooting. Come on, let's get out of here. You can threaten me all you like, but you can't frighten me. Devereaux cattle have been watering Meads Creek for a hundred years, and it'll continue to do so. 
But you don't seem to understand, Mr. Devereaux. That land doesn't belong to you any longer. You have no right to run your cattle there. It will be mine again once the old tax monies are paid up. You'll go back and tell those upstarts at Rosita they'll be crawling on their hands and knees before I get through with them. They'll be begging me for water when that land is mine again. Now go on, you get out of here. Go on! Glad you're home, me, 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 those. Yeah, I did, Mr. Dean. What are you doing up so late? Isn't it past your bedtime? A blasted foreman from Rosita was here. We saw him leave. What's the trouble? The same old argument. We have no right to the land or to the water where our cattle feed and drink. And they speak the truth. That's the hard pill to swallow. There was a time when they wouldn't dare speak to a devil in such a manner, even if it were the truth. Time isn't far off, and that land will be yours again, Grandfather. Uh -huh. We're going to buy it back. Right, Paul? Yes, Ed. We're working it out now, Granddad. Oh, but that's impossible. It will take a great deal of money. You mean that you really accomplished what you went to San Francisco for? That's right, Granddad. The banks are going to loan us the money. Aren't they, Ed? It's all fixed up, Grandfather. We're going back in a few weeks and pick up the money. Then... Watch out for that Devereaux smoke. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Naturally, it took a few signatures on our note, but we finally got your old friend Verdugo to sign. And from then on, it was easy sailing. My old friend Verdugo. After all these years, I told you you would remember. Will it be enough to buy back the Meat Creek property and, and, and stock it? Enough and more, too. We'll fly high and fancy, Grandfather. We'll have $100,000. A hundred thousand <laughs> But that... That's ever drink, boys. That calls for a drink. Such a good law calls for a drink. Can you imagine? We're going to... We're going to have the old... The old Rancho Altos Montes back again. It's going to live again. Here, boys. Here. Here, to the... To the old... To the old Rancho Altos Montes. Here, boys. Saludos. More than a week now, Johnny Douglas had been moving in an ever-narrowing circle with Santa Marta as the pivotal point. Three little grains of calyx salt and a few wood bark fibers were all the leads Douglas had to work on as he went from lumber camp to cattle ranch, trying to identify the composite drawings of the two men prepared by Professor Bowen. Men seldom stayed long on these jobs. They came and went, and few questions were asked. Foremen were glad to get help and didn't bother much about a man's family connection where he came from or whether or not he was drawing his pay under an assumed name. Then, just when the weight of discouragement rested heaviest on Johnny Douglas' shoulders, the three little grains of salt paid off with startling suddenness. Uh, anything serious, Mr. Douglas? Train robbery and murder. You don't say. Hmm. You want me, Mr. Travis? Oh, yes, Frank. Uh, this is Mr. Douglas. This is my foreman, Frank Kent. How do you oh, do? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Douglas here is looking for two men who are wanted for train robbery and murder. He has reason to believe that their brothers have been working as lumberjacks and cowhands. Look, you ever see two men who resemble these sketches? Why, of course, it'd have to be them. You mean you recognize them? Well, I wouldn't want to put a rope around the wrong man's neck, but I'd swear these two men are the Devereaux brothers. By Jove, I think you're right. At least they fit the description. These Devereaux boys work for you? Oh, they have occasionally. Well, your grandfather used to own most of this country around here. He lost it through bad management, one thing or another. Old man's pretty hot-headed. Boys are just like him. Well, they didn't hesitate to shoot four men down in cold blood. That would be Edmund, the oldest. He's just like the old man, fight at the drop of a hat. Uh, you'll come to their gate about four miles down the road, what there is left of it. Well, much obliged to you. Well, you'd better go on into town and get some help from the sheriff. He'll never take those Devereaux boys without a fight. Thanks for the tip. I'm not trying to be a dead hero. How far is it to the next town? Glenby's about 12 miles straight up number 62. Oh, by the way, don't say anything about this to anyone, will you? I'm a lazy hunter. I'll take sitting ducks anytime. 
Twenty minutes later, the sheriff in Glenby was rounding up his deputies. Hey, Bert, come on, Hoffman. We got a job. Here. What's up? Sheriff's getting up a posse to pick up the Devereaux boys. Hello, Rose. You're just in time to give me a hand. You see, this is a map of the original grant received by my family from the King of Spain. Mr. Devereaux, where's Paul and Ed? They must be somewhere around. Why? What's the matter? Something wrong? Well, that's what I came to find out. Call him, please, and hurry. You frightened me. What's the matter? Paul! What is it? Rose McCrary's here. She's, she wants to see you both of you. Uh, she, she acts like it was important. I told you to keep her away from here. Listen, Ed, we played everything your way so far. When it comes to Rose, I do as I please. Come along, Mr. Mm-hmm. Hello, Paul. Sorry to come busting in on you like this, but there's something you ought to know. What's that, baby? One of Sheriff Dodson's deputies came running into the barber shop a little while ago and called out Bert Training. I heard him say the sheriff was getting up a posse to pick up the Devereaux boys. What is it, Paul? Why should the sheriff want you in here? You didn't get into trouble in San Francisco, did you, boys? Well, yes, we did. There was an argument and some shooting. You did the shooting, Ed. All right, I did the shooting. It was self-defense. Listen. Coffee. They're after us, Paul. We've got to run for it. There's no time for explanations now, Grandfather. We've got to get out of here. Come on, and don't be afraid to use that gun. I'm getting touch with it, My fault. All my fault. They're not to blame. I fill their heads with the crazy ideas about making the name of Devereaux mean something again. If it hadn't been for me, they would never have done such a terrible deed. I still can't believe they would do it. The fact that they ran away is pretty conclusive evidence of their guilt. <laughs> have you a recent photograph of your grandsons? No, sir. They haven't. I have a, I have a snapshot they sent me from the logging camp last winter. That'll do fine, thanks. Any luck? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Douglas, but we'll have to have horses to follow him. I'll drive you back, Sheriff. Have your men contact all farmhouses and ranches. Keep a close watch on all trucks, buses, and horses. Right, Douglas. Mr. Devereaux. Yes. That girl that just left, is she a relative of yours? You mean Rose? No, sir, no. She's the, she's the daughter of Sam McCrary, the barber in Granby. 
She's Paul's girl. Oh, I see. Well, I'm sorry about all this for your sake. It's not a very pleasant experience for either of us. Good night. Good night. Sheriff. Better leave a couple of men here in case they double back. All right. You and Bert stay here, Charlie. I'll have you relieved later. One of you cover the front and one the back. As soon as I get back to town, I'll have the telephone operators check the entire country around here. Hey, give me a ride into town, will you, mister? I've just been held up and my car stolen. Oh, hello, Mr. Dodson. Your car was stolen? That's right was that youngest Devereaux boy, Paul. He looked kind of wild-eyed and stuck a gun in my side. Told me to get out, no argument. No use trifling with that Devereaux outfit. No telling what they're gonna do. Well, hop in, we'll drive into town. I didn't kill those men. You do believe me, don't you? I don't know what to believe. Yeah. Keep an eye on Sheriff. I'm going to have a look around. I'm sorry to trouble you, Mr. Perry, but there are a couple of questions I didn't get a chance to ask you out of Devereaux. May I come in? Why, of course. Just what was it you wanted to know, Mr. Douglas? Well, considering you're Paul Devereaux's girl, it seems entirely likely that he'll try to see you. And if he does, try to convince him to give himself up. Because if he doesn't, we're going to have to shoot it out with him, and in the end, he'll be dead. Anything else? Well, there's just a chance. Cute dog you have there, trying to get in that door. Oh, he wants his ball, that's all. Here, yeah, Trooper. Go get it. If you don't mind, Mr. Douglas, I have to prepare dinner for my father. Certainly not. I just wanted to say that there's quite a reward out for the Devereaux boys. It might go a long way in fixing up a broken heart. Good night, Mr. Douglas. Good night. Please hurry and get out of here. I have a feeling he's still hanging around outside. I'll step out the back way. No, wait. Take that door to the cellar. I'll go out and open the outside doors. My car's in the driveway. I don't need your car, darling. I still have the one I stole. I hid it in a grove at the edge of town. Once I get out of here, I'm all right. Good luck, Paul. I'll be back for you, baby. You know that, don't you?
The next ten hours, Rose McCreary was torn with doubt and uncertainty, plagued by a thousand fears. Was Paul alive? Was he lying by the roadside somewhere, nursing his wounds? Or was he dead? It seemed incredible that he should twice escape a deadly hail of bullets, and yet, and yet womanlike, Rose McCreary clung to the fragile hope that he had escaped. Now the chase began in earnest. For the first time, Douglas and the police knew for certain who they were looking for. Wanted for train holdup and murder, Edmund and Paul Deverlow, brothers. Description as follows. Edmund Deverlow, six foot two inches, black hair. Hello, Salt Lake City. Sacramento calling. Be on the lookout for two men wanted for murder and train holdup. Description as follows. Attention, listeners. Two men who shot it out with railroad special agents and sheriff's deputies yesterday afternoon near Glenbay were still at large today with every police agency in the state alerted and on the lookout for them. Anyone seeing these men should report it promptly. For train pulled up and murder. Tall man looked like one of the Devereaux boys. He hopped to ride on a truck. I'm sure it was the three Devereaux boys. Yes, I'm positive. What? Only two. Well, maybe they had a friend with them. At the end of a week, the Devereaux brothers were still at large. Their trail had been lost completely. The tempo of the chase died down until finally it went off the front pages of newspapers altogether. It began to be referred to as that Devereaux case as though already it had been assigned to the files of unsolved crimes. Well, I don't know the authorities they're quoting, but they're sure right. Devereaux Trail, stone cold. Don't have anyone to blame but myself, either. I bungled the whole job. That's why Wilcox came up here. Oh, I think Mr. Wilcox realizes all the good work you're doing. Well, without the leads you've dug up, they wouldn't even have identified the Devereaux brothers. Come on now. Knock the gloom off your face. You don't want the boss to see you downhearted. Shall I quit now or wait till he fires me? Oh, you never can tell. He might have some good news for you. Well, here goes. I can certainly see what you've been up against. Yeah. Well, you got my wire. Yeah, I got it. Pressure from the powers that be, I take it. You can't blame them. It's bad all down the line. The Devereaux brothers have got to be caught. I know my head's in the block, Chief. I'd do anything I could if we had something to go on. But we haven't. There isn't a single lead. We haven't run down and found nothing. Maybe you could use some help. I was thinking of sending Wilkinson over from the Oil Valley Division. Uh, Wilkinson's a good man. I'll bow out whenever you tell him to take over. Isn't that a little premature? Johnny's been doing a whale of a job so far. So far isn't good enough, Olmstead, and you know that. Chief's right, Phil. It's a payoff that counts. Excuse me, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, Johnny, Jake and Cat have some wonderful news for you. Go ahead, boys, tell him. Well, we were hunting bird eggs. We found almost everything except the hawk and a magpie. We were coming along the mill road when I spied the old pine with the top knocked off by lightning. That's right away, I said, Jake. Oh, boy, there's plenty of old pine. Wait a minute, wait a minute, one at a time. Go ahead, Tad, you talk first. 
We climbed that old tree and guess what we found? Oh, please, Dad, this is no guessing game. Tell Tony what you found. A mail sack. A mail sack at the top of the pine? Yes, sir. Come on, let's go. Judging by the weight, the money's still in it. We'll find out when we get back to the office. Put on your horse, Sherry. No way, Chief. The Devereaux boys will come back for this sack the minute they run out of money. I don't think we should disappoint them. You've got something there. We leave the bag here, stake out the tree. The minute they show up, we grab them. Exactly. Only we take out the money first, just in case. Sounds like a good plan, Johnny. Authorized to open this sack? Yeah, by the postal authorities here. kids, looks like you earned yourself a fair day's pay, particularly if our plan goes through. Come on, Sheriff, let's put this in the saddlebag. Carrying out Johnny Douglas's orders, they transferred the money to the Sheriff's saddlebags, then filled the mail sack with paper and rocks and put it back in his hiding place. Thus, the trap was baited and the waiting began all over again. Where is it, Pete? Quall just came in from the switchback down to Tunnel 13. Brakey just kicked a tramp off the rods, and after he did, he remembered he looked like one of the Devereaux boys, the younger one. How long ago was that? Oh, not more than an hour or so. Sheriff, spot your men around here, and don't make a move unless I do. It's just possible the brothers may have a rendezvous, and they'll both show up. Okay, Johnny. Pete, you lead the horses up the canyon for a mile or so. You, you cover from that manzanita over there on the hill. Max, you and Charlie from that bush over there. Lucille, you better go back with the boys. Signal from one of our boys. You signal once, that means there's only one. Chance he's gonna meet his brother. Let's follow him. There could be another entrance to that mine shaft, Sheriff. You and your men take the other side of the ridge. The chief and I'll take this side. I like this spot for us up there, Johnny. Come on. Never let up for a minute. Yeah, I know. Where did that sack come from? From the tree where we left it. So that's why you got here early. You were gonna pull a fast one, weren't you, Paul? You were gonna grab your share of the money and run off for that McCreary dame, weren't you? So what? Half the money in that sack belongs to me anyway. But not to spend on a cheap little dame. She was only making a play for you because you had her believing you were gonna be a big shot someday. I don't like. Why, you? We're pacified that and I'll really have to get tough, Paul. 
You don't want to forget. I killed four guys for this money. Not you. Remember that. So you heard your story all fixed, didn't you? Well, you're not going to get away with it. Brother or no brother, I'll bash your brains. You know, you don't tell me what you did with that money. Why don't you hide it? Paul, answer me, you fool. What did you do with the money? Answer me. I want that money. All right, General, put up your hands. Come on, get up. Put your hands behind your back. And so the Devereaux case ended, with one brother dead, and the other captured. And the long record of the special agents for never failing to get their men continued unbroken. Things quieted down in Santa Marta after that, but not for long, and special agent Johnny Douglas never complained again of things being dull. In fact, there were times when Johnny wondered if things weren't happening too quickly. Yeah? Yeah? Another boy? Yeah, well, 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 thanks. Come on, kids. Doc says we can go see your mama. You do, kid brother. 